Good morning and good afternoon. Welcome to the Weekend Wellness Hour show today. We have a very interesting guest today, someone who I had met on a new app called Clubhouse, where it's an audio conversation, almost like you're in a conference, but it's with people from all over the world. And Dr. Madi Brown is actually in Belgium, but does have training in Arizona, where a lot of you know that I am currently located. And Dr. Madi Brown is a naturopathic physician. He is a transformational life coach. He has studied nutrition. He works with professional athletes. He has a whole slew of talents and skills. And so we're gonna pick his brain today to talk about toxic stress, how it impacts children and how it can influence how those children handle situations and their health as adults. So I wanna thank you so much, Dr. Mahdi. Thanks for being here today. It's truly a pleasure, Dr. Amy. Thank you for having me. <laughs> Wonderful. Thanks. Thanks for coming on this weekend too, because you're over in Belgium. So this is the evening time for you. So yes. how in the world did you get to Belgium? And <laughs> tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, Belgium, it was really fascinating. Uh, at the time I was consulting for a functional medical lab in Atlanta, Georgia, and I was doing a lot of research, actually interestingly enough, on the impact of stress on the gut microbiome and how that can influence that bi-directional influence of not only your gut health, but also how you are experiencing life from a mental and behavioral standpoint. And so while I was doing that, that, that those, those presentations and doing the research and presenting these studies to the different uh, scientists and other medical uh, professionals who were coming to these um, workshops and conferences that we were doing, it really piqued my interest in wanting to know more. And so mm -hmm. I started looking at PhD programs around the world that you know would allow me to further this exploration and looking at just how the gut microbiome is influencing behavior, influencing emotions mm -hmm. and, and, and cognitive uh, you know, expression within us. And there was a, a extraordinary school in Berlin that actually had that going on. So I was like, okay, looking into that. And at the time, I actually came out to Arizona to uh, <laughs> celebrate my birthday with my 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 friends there, and uh -huh. I was discussing this with them. I said, "Yeah, it's an amazing school out there in Germany," and I'm looking into it. And I have two of my very close dear friends. Uh, they actually went through a holistic nutrition program that myself and another physician created, and they had a wellness center, also part of their restaurant, where they would. <laughs> create healthy meals and, and, and protocols for the clients that they were working with and organizations who would, you know, utilize their services for their, you know, employees. And part of our holistic nutrition program was uh, an internship. And so I had, you know, walked away from the school and I was no longer involved with uh, any parts of it um, from, from a professional standpoint any longer. And mm -hmm. they were one of the places where students could come and do internships and it just so happened that uh, the student from Belgium actually came to do an internship there. And she wanted to meet the founders of the school, myself and this other doctor. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, I was now domiciled in uh, Atlanta. And so uh, we ended up having a conversation via phone. I was actually only anticipating that to be 30 minutes, ended up being four and a half hours. <laughs> oh, that's quite long. <laughs> yes. And that we, there was, a, there was a spark that happened with that conversation. Oh. And from there, we, we started mm -hmm. to get to know each other, each other better. And uh, over time, that grew into a wonderful, beautiful relationship. Wow. Now we're married and Aww. I am here. <laughs> wonderful. That's great. Yeah. That's a and nice love story. <laughs> yeah, exactly. What's interesting is the whole idea about going to the PhD program is mm -hmm. kind of completely went away. But yeah. that, that sparked the idea of me considering moving to Europe. Wow. And when and meeting her, it just said, okay, it just made sense. And so, yeah, here I am. That's wonderful. And then, so prior to that, you got your physician's degree in naturopathic medicine. Yes. Correct. And what made you go into that? So that I would say probably the foundation for all of that started with my grandmother. Um, I grew up in a, a diverse household. Uh, my mother is uh, half white, half Native American, and my father's African American. And so okay. we grew up in a lot of, um, growing up in that environment, 
there was a lot of native traditions in regards to natural forms of healing that were just being imparted specifically from, from my grandmother to me. Okay. And as a child, I was quite sick and there were a lot of home remedies that she would uh, administer mm -hmm. that I would get, you know, start to feel some reprieve and, and, and recover, you know, from these, mm -hmm. these conditions that I had. And that really has had a profound impact. So I wanted to know more about this. And then at age 13, I became very ill. I, I developed a very rare sinus and fungal infection. That was like oh. the third known case in the US at the time. Okay. And I had to go to Walter Reed Medical Center because my father was in the US Army at the time. And so they, they had the, the only place they could deal with it was in Washington DC at the Walter Reed Medical Center. And so I spent my whole eighth grade year in the hospital. And it was during, during that experience that I came to the conclusion that I wanted to become a doctor, but I didn't want to be this kind of doctor because I felt like I was a lab rat to some extent, you yeah. know, to them because I was this very unique case that mm -hmm. they were experiencing. And so the, the foundation that my grandmother instilled in me and my experience in the hospital and, and seeing how, you know, medicine can help people that planted the seeds. And then I discovered naturopathy when I was in Los Angeles, actually studying Chinese medicine at the time. Okay. And I was working for a physician uh, in uh, Beverly Hills. We had a, a integrated infertility practice where East met West, where we had the acupuncture and other holistic modalities along with the conventional side of IVF. And I just saw that beautiful bridge. And a doctor who I was working for just so happened her son-in-law was a naturopathic medical doctor. He had just moved from Colorado and he had set up his practice in Calabasas. And I was kind of over there helping him out, you know, poking around in the office mm -hmm. and asking questions. And and at the time I was struggling with high, high blood pressure, hypertension. Oh, wow. And I told him my story and he's within a matter of a 30 minute conversation. He said, I know exactly what's wrong with you. He said, you're magnesium deficient. I was like, huh, what? How do you yeah. know that? He said, I can just tell from what you said. And he put me on a protocol. And within two and a half months, I went from being on a medication for 10 years to no medications at all. And I was like, okay. I want to know this. <laughs> yeah. And so I ended up transferring from the Chinese medical school that I was in and I applied to the naturopathic medical school in Arizona and I was accepted okay. and that kind of set the sail. Wonderful. And then now you are re really experienced in helping people with toxic stress. So yes. Let's talk about that. How did you get into that? And yeah, tell us um, a little bit. And interestingly enough, when we created the Holistic Nutrition um, Program, it was at a vocational school there in Tempe, Arizona called the Southwest um, Institute of the Healing Arts, SWEHA. Mm -hmm. And ASU came calling and they, they just had started a stress management program there. It only had one course that was running and they were wanting to expand that. And so uh, they heard about what we were doing over there. Uh, as we had and how successful the holistic nutrition program came and they wanted us to, me myself and this other physician to go over there and start working with them so they actually hired us on as professors and we okay. formulated this new holistic nutrition uh, excuse me this uh, stress management program there that just really okay. began to take off in an extraordinary way and the principles that I was taught in naturopathy you know for treating the whole person we approached it from that philosophy and utilizing those principles and understanding the innate healing power that we have within as a foundation for that stress management program. And the results were extraordinary with the students. It became very popular to the point that doc, it got the attention of the president, Dr. Crow. Oh, and nice. they're like, okay, we need to really look at changing the narrative for ASU because at that time it was known as a party school. Yes, it was. <laughs> and so, you know, he wanted to make it a school that was now known for wellness and, and well being of his students. Mm -hmm. And so we were a part of that initiative to really create this whole new department based around managing stress. And at that time, they had a lot of students, especially within the engineering and the architectural programs who were dealing with extraordinary stress. We had, unfortunately, a couple of suicides on the campus. So it was something that was very a very pressing issue that needed to be handled. And so we established that there. And that really, for me personally, just charted my path as far as what I wanted to do, because it made me Look back on um, when I was in medical school, I actually went through a burnout, went into nervous okay. exhaustion because I just overextended myself so much. I had to take an actual quarter off to just mm -hmm. recover and heal. And I created for myself a kind of a, a protocol and a process of mm -hmm. not only restoring the body, but also reframing my perception of life and reframing how I perceive life and stress and how I was managing stress. And that set the foundation for what we were able to really put into practical app, practical app application at ASU 
And so that was the foundation for what has now become what I do. That's incredible. And part of my work is looking at how stress causes physical changes in the body and the way the muscles mm. perform. And so I help mm. people change out of that by using a specific breathing technique and body repositioning. But we also know that stress and toxic stress, chronic stress influences the brain. So can you tell us a little bit about that and kind of go into that a little bit and how it really can impact our behavior and attitude, all of those things. Yeah, of course. Yeah. So, you know, uh, and, and a lot of it is very interesting when it comes to stress, the stress response is a part of our natural makeup as human beings. Mm -hmm. It is actually our body's way, our physiology's way of rising to the occasion to deal with a potential threat. So it's actually a very, very good thing. However, it becomes an issue when it becomes that that stress response becomes chronic. It's constantly being activated over long durations of time. And those hormones, you know, cortisol, epinephrine, norepinephrine, these stress hormones that are now being activated begin to actually cause great damage to the body as a whole. And specifically with the brain, stress hormone has a profound impact on the limbic system itself, you know, and for most of us, a lot of that fear is in that limbic area with the amygdala and, and how we are actually uh, processing information. And so when you are dealing with a lot of chronic exposure to stress, it actually begins to change the anatomical structure of the brain. Uh, neuronal pathways begin to alter. And one thing I, I like, I don't know if you're familiar with Dr. Joseph Spenza, one thing yes. he, lo he loves to say is neurons that wire together, fire together. And that holds true, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> either for, you know, wonderful habits that you're creating or habitual ways of being as far as fear, anxiety, and stress. And so if you're constantly being exposed to stress, your thoughts are constantly focusing on things or anticipating negative outcomes, this begins to create a host of signaling within the brain that starts to wire the brain in such a way that it's heightened mm -hmm. to look out for any particular threat. And even the most minute things now become very exacerbating to mm -hmm. the body and to your life because of this heightened anatomical, anatomical structuring of the brain through neuroplasticity that you've now formulated within your, your own you know, neuroanatomy that you now have to uh, rewire. And so the more toxic exposure to stress you're dealing with, be it in the home with you know, relationships, family finances, if it's at work, whatever the circumstances be, if it's a health issue, whatever it is that is creating this chronic exposure to stress, that is reinforced through neuroplasticity, through rewiring of the brain to begin to focus more and more and more on that. So this is one of the key things that we have to look at shifting with individuals who are, you know, very susceptible to anxiety, depression, and, and a host of other things due to the chronic exposure to stress. And what's really fascinating is that the younger you are, mm -hmm. the more vulnerable you are. And specifically with children, they are mm -hmm. most susceptible to this re restructuring of the brain and the neurochemistry based on their experience and exposure to stress. And what ages are we talking about from infant or three yeah, years well, old? What age? Yeah, frankly, uh, even in utero, okay. uh, pre prenatal, uh, wow. you actually can impact um, through the mother and her own stress experience can begin to help structure that child's uh, nervous system. And, and I look at it like this, Dr. Amy, when you observe all life, every living being that comes into the world is always prepared for the environment in which it's about to come. Right. So, if you, if, so if you think about it like that, if you have, for example, like uh, a baby gazelle out in the bush of Africa, Mm -hmm. Within a matter of minutes, it has the capacity to get up and walk and run and flee if a little lion or something's hanging out in the bush waiting. So it already starts to develop the capacities to you know, defend and protect itself. Mm -hmm. We're no different. And so if our mother and our father, there's discord there and the mother's under a lot of stress and she's producing stress hormone in, within her body, you know, that stress hormone can 
be transmitted through the placenta to the child. And as it's formulating and developing, it's picking up the signals of what environment is about to enter based on how the mother's perceiving and experiencing her environment. And that has a profound impact on its development. So when it comes into life, it's, the nervous system is prepared for that kind of environment. And so if the environment is one that is extraordinarily uh, unhealthy, over time, that child's nervous system, its brain structure, its uh, adaptability to the environment mm -hmm. will be fashioned around that kind of experience. And they will be much more sensitive and susceptible to stress. And that can lead into a host of things down the road as they grow and become adults. And so it, it can start at a very early age. And one of the quite profound things is um, with children specifically, as far as their brainwave capacity. They are from ages zero, from birth to around age seven, they're literally walking around in delta and theta wave brain, brain functioning, meaning they're walking around in a hypnotic state. And it's not as much as what you tell your children during that time, but it's more so about how you behave, the tonality of your voice, mm -hmm. your emotions, the environment is what is imprinting upon them, their sense of self and their sense of the reality environment that they're in. Whether they perceive that environment as safe or as a threat. Mm -hmm. And of course, mom and dad being the primary caregivers, literally in the eyes of the child, you are in essence, God to them. Yeah. They know no other authority. Right. And you're shaping for them and you're demonstrating to them what the world is like through their perception of how you see it and how you communicate and express it to them. And I'm not talking about just what you do verbally. It's about even how you behave, your energy, all of yeah. that. They're sensitive to, they're picking up that information and they're writing out the story and narrative for who they are, their beliefs about themselves, their beliefs about the environment in which they're now interacting and how safe they are in it. So that's a very crucial time. And they've done a host of different studies. And there's one specifically called the Adverse Childhood Experience Study that was done by Kaiser Permanente and the CDC back in the early 90s, where they looked at uh, uh, 17 over 17,000 people. And they looked at these adverse childhood experiences that they were having. And they looked at three areas of adverse childhood experience. Um, abuse, be it like mental, emotional, or sexual abuse physical abuse or um, neglect. And that was physical or mental, emotional neglect. And then there was like any kind of household dysfunction. If there was divorce going on, if there was yeah. addictions or drug abuse, if the mother was being treated violently, um, if there was any mental illness, like specifically, like if the one parent had depression, the child is observing this kind of environment and seeing the impact that that state, be it, you know, whatever mental condition they had is impacting the household as a whole, all, all of those were considered adverse childhood experiences. And the more of those that a child encountered, the greater likelihood that they were going to be more prone to behavioral issues themselves as they were developing. They showed a correlation with their success from a career and financial standpoint. The more adverse childhood experiences they had, the less career fulfillment and financial success they would experience. They would be more prone to risky uh, addictive behaviors. They also would be more prone to physical issues like cardiovascular disease, cancer, diabetes, you know, to name a few. So these individuals with a greater amount of adverse childhood experiences they had at these very impressionable, vulnerable years of their life as adults, would experience these outcomes. And they also noted too, that they even had a shorter lifespan than adults who did not have these adverse childhood experiences. So it's quite important during the very early years of a, of a child as this human soul is coming into life and experiencing this new world of self and expression that if it's encountering an environment that has a lot of toxicity in it, mm -hmm. it shapes how he, it's going to experience this journey. And how much toxicity is needed before you see a change in the, the neurochemistry, the, the imprinting, how, how much are we talking? Well, well any, yeah. A little question, bit. Well, yeah. yeah well, one well, day. Obviously, well, this is the whole thing. It's about uh, 
if a child experiences, say for instance, a, an accident or a, a violent trauma in the house, mm -hmm. if it's exposed to buffering by parents showing love, concern and compassion with it, the effects of that experience are gonna be much less and the child would actually adapt to it and overcome it. But if it's prolonged and that buffering mechanism of support is not there, then it does not take long um, to really begin to set in because you gotta understand within the, the, the just the neuroanatomy and neurochemistry of this child, it's every day new neuronal pathways are being written. Every single day, the child is just taking in information and learning about his environment and, and his entire body is literally like a sponge, <laughs> just soaking up what, what the experience of life is to it based on the environment in which it finds itself. And so if there's no buffering mechanism, as they call it, that can counter the adverse childhood experience uh, in a very short period of time, you know, within months, that wiring can begin to take a hold in this child's brain and you know uh, neuroanatomical development and began to set patterns up that will eventually affect it in life but the very beautiful thing about it the brain in and of itself is neuroplastic so even with that and like a, a number of the students and clients that i work with today we take them through what we call a, a, a life map and we do a trajectory of the wonderful things that they've occurred over the course of their life from birth up to where they currently are and then the adverse things and we look for the patterns there and we can actually help them go back in and reframe this and we and even change how they even perceive and their experience in their lives now um, based on going back and just teaching them how to create new neuronal pathways that are going to be more serving and help them mitigate the ex adverse experiences that they may have had in their youth. And it could be like 20 or 30 years earlier, but because of just the beautiful neuroplasticity of the brain, it doesn't matter where you are actually at in your journey, what you've experienced in your past, the body has the capacity to rewrite that story. That's great. And I imagine once you start working on reframing the past and shifting some of the negativity surrounding it and the maybe a protective response, I would expect that you would see in future events with practice, there's a different response. So you're not following the same protective Precisely. mechanism, right? As if you're not going to know, you're no longer in that survival mode where oh. your default is to be in high alert, to go into survival mode. Everything is a potential threat to you. Mm -hmm. And so capacities are actually locked down and shut down to protect you and you're more coming from a place of emotional reactivity than mm -hmm. emotional response and so just through yeah just the cultivation and reprogramming over time and the one, and the one thing that people have to understand is that you didn't get this way overnight so you have to be very patient and very compassionate and loving with yourself mm -hmm. as you go through the journey of self-transformation and self-discovery i can imagine that i mean i grew up in pretty stressful household. And I, I know when I got into my early twenties, you know, if a glass fell on the floor, it was a disaster because we grew mm. up, you know, sleeping on the floor, eating 10 cent meals. And so mm. if I dropped anything as a kid, I was in big trouble. And so mm. then that carried into my, you know, early twenties that if that happened, I was, I had that emotional reactivity and it wasn't until I started doing a lot of personal development work over the past several years that I shifted and mm -hmm. it was, well, it was a process. Mm -hmm. And now with something like that, it's like, okay, well, it's a glass. Okay. I'm going to clean it up, but make yeah. sure no one got cut. And it's Indeed. not the end of the world and it's not going to exactly. determine the rest of my day or exactly. week or anything. Yeah. And yeah. it does take a lot of work. It is, mm -hmm. it's a constant practice, a daily practice in order to get your neurons to change. Yeah, and it, it's, it's the, har the hardest work we ever, I, I feel that we ever have to do in life is thinking true thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> we will do anything else except that <laughs> and so when you start to have to really do critical thinking and, and self-reflection and self-analysis and really looking at you know just paying attention being very conscious of how you're showing up how you're experiencing life how you are you know your thought process from moment to moment and the emotional expression from moment to moment it requires a lot of energy 
And for most of us, we are so accustomed to just kind of shutting that, those capacities and components of us down yeah. and through numbing it through movies, TV, social media, whatever we want to do uh, to not engage in that work. But if you do, that's where the magic is, in my opinion, where the true power is. And you have ex an extraordinary ability to really transform your life in amazing ways. And you'll be surprised at who you become on the other side of it when you do. Right. Now, let's say, let's say you had a rough childhood and mm -hmm. you then have a child and you yes. maybe haven't come to the realization on shifting out of that protective state. They haven't met someone like you who can mm -hmm. help them do that. Now, what gets transferred to this new baby? Is there a uh, genetic component that sets this baby up then or a genetic predisposition? Well, it's, it's a very fascinating question. And mm -hmm. I'm not, I, I don't want to give a simplified answer of just saying yes, but it, it kind of is yes. Mm -hmm. And and let me just give some contextual, you know, qualification of mm -hmm. with that. So they did some studies. Uh, there's two that I'll, I'll talk about. They did one with Holocaust survivors. Mm -hmm. And we've all heard the stories of what had taken place during that time, that horrific time. Mm -hmm. And so what they wanted to do, and they did this up at Mount Sinai up in New York, uh, to, you know, really kind of see. And so they took Holocaust survivors and it was a small study. I think they had about a cohort of maybe 30 or some odd people in it. And they looked at their offspring. I think it was like maybe uh, 22 or some odd children of these Holocaust survivors. And what they wanted to see if, if there was a uh, genetic component to their experiences surviving mm -hmm. the Holocaust and how that translated into their children. What they found is that um, the children were more prone and more susceptible to developing PTSD, even though they had not gone through the trauma. Okay. And they started looking at the results and they saw that, you know, there was uh, DNA methylation or these mm -hmm. tags with on, with, on the DNA that were methylated, these methylated tags that actually made these individuals more susceptible. And they had another cohort of uh, folks of Jewish descent and ancestry who were not exposed, you know, who were not in Europe during the time of the Holocaust and everything took, that took place in the 40s. And they looked at their children and they didn't have that same methylation. And so that methylation was passed from the survivors to their children. And so it's received kind of mixed, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, feedback because it's like, first of all, it was a small study. And then also too, one of the things with post-traumatic stress disorder is, you know, for example, Dr. Amy, you don't personally have to go through something. A family member, you could hear about the tragic experience of a family member and that could create such a trauma in you where it becomes a post-traumatic stress response. Okay. And so, so that was another component, you know, like, okay, they wanted that, they, they questioned, okay, how much of this is actually due to, you know, uh, a genetic transfer okay. to the children or just the parents talking about the experience and other family members and the horrific nature of what took place if that impression in itself impacted these children and how they move forward in their life. And so you have, you know, it's, it's kind of a, a mixed bag, if you will. Mm -hmm. And but the thing is, we still scientifically do not know how it works. And there's another study that they did on mice that they were able to track it down through. They used uh, male mice, and what they would do with them it was a, a acetophenone, which is like this chemical that is a, a chemical that comes off a of fruit that we can smell. It smells okay. sweet. Mm -hmm. And so most times if a mouse smells this, they're going to go to the fruit and because it's a sweet smell, it's going to bring them there to just try to eat mm -hmm. it. So they wanted to make the mice afraid of this. So what they did to these male mice, where they would kind of strap them in to this little container and they would admit, you know, put this uh, acetophenone into the air and let them smell it. And as they smelled it, they would shock them. Oh, and wow. They kept doing this over and over and over again to where as soon as they smelled the acetophenone coming from the fruit, mm -hmm. they would just run. Oh, okay. They would, they would, they would, it was just now a fear response to this. And so 
after the study, they mated these male mice to females who didn't have this experience. And they looked at the pups and they administered the same acetophenone to these pups and they fled as well. Then they took those pups, grew them up. They didn't torch them like they did the, 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 the parent, the mm -hmm. dad, right. and mated them. And their offspring had the same fear response to that right. smell. And so what they recognized from that is that there was a transgenerational imprinting from this epigenetic, you know, stimulus from dad to offspring to offspring, you know, three right. generations that was being transferred through the sperm. Mm -hmm. And so this has it was been, it's been a quite profound study and it's been reproduced over and over again. And, and so that speaks to the capacity, but they don't know, we do not know the mechanism of action how and why this is doing this. And that's, and so scientists are still kind of skeptical because they're like, oh, okay, we, we don't know. We can't, we can't find a mechanism of action, mm -hmm. but, we, we, but we're seeing the phenotypical expression. Mm -hmm. And this so, kind of helps with the, with the Holocaust study. Exactly. It, exactly. it negates the part of the communication possibly mm -hmm. creating the PTSD. Mm -hmm. This, because, well, I know mice communicate at some level, but this kind of eliminates that type of verbal interaction. Oh, but this is oh, no, this, this is the thing to speak to the communication part. Mm -hmm. the, the dad never had access to the offspring. Oh, okay. So that's all. even better. Okay. Yeah. So so once once the the the, the female mouse was impregnated, the male mm -hmm. mouse was excluded from the scenario from, from that okay. point on. They they never had access to that mouse or those mice any longer. Mm -hmm. And so all you had were the female giving birth mm -hmm. to the offspring and then that offspring mating and giving birth mm -hmm. to more offspring. Wow. And that was the genetic expression or the phenotypical expression that was actually being demonstrated by this, them smelling that particular acetophenone and them fleeing mm -hmm. from it, you know, out of fear due to the conditioning that the grandparent had. Yeah, that's incredible. So if we apply this back to humans and mm -hmm. we realize that there are impacts that are possibly passed down through generation. If you have kids, do you want to start to get them in some type of program to help them manage stress? Or do you, do you just try to change your environment to become more supportive and maybe even get help yourself so you can create a different environment? So what does I would that say look all, like? all, all of the above. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. because, because it, it, it's really multifaceted. And the thing mm -hmm. is, uh, understanding there's there's i don't know if you ever read the book um the biology of belief mm -mm, i have by dr yet. dr bruce lipton amazing mm -hmm. book and he was you know a, a a scientist and he did a lot of genetic studies and so what they were doing was very interesting um he was taking stem cells and they were replicating these stem cells because so they had the exact identical genetic you know makeup mm -hmm. it was basically they took one cell and just multiplied it Okay. And so what they did is uh, they put it in a petri dish, they created a culture, a membrane for this uh, stem cell to grow on. And initially it, it was growing within the culture, muscle tissue. And they could test it where the muscle tissue would contract and everything else. They're like, okay, great. Mm -hmm. So then what he did is he created another petri dish with a different culture medium within it. Mm -hmm. And he put 50, 50, uh, more of those stem cells, the same identical stem, stem cell mm -hmm. into this new Petri dish and it developed bone tissue. Okay. And then he took another Petri dish with mm -hmm. a different culture medium, same exact identical stem cell mm -hmm. and it created fat tissue. Okay. And so this was like, and they repeated this over and over again. And what they saw is that the stem cell, even though it had the same genetic DNA sequence, mm -hmm. didn't change based on the environment, how that DNA expressed, determined what tissue ended up in that Petri dish based right. on it, it responded to the environment. And yeah. so 
the environment of who we are, I, I always kind of joke around and said, the human beings, we're the ultimate stem cell. We, our <laughs> biology, uh, we adapt our physiology, our biochemistry, and who we are as these extraordinary beings to the environment in which we find. Mm -hmm. And so when you're dealing with stress and you're dealing with um, adverse experiences from childhood or the parent is dealing with these things, the environment has to shift, not only externally, but you have to look at the environment of the spirit, the environment of the mind, the environment of the emotions, the environment of the physical body, biochemically and physiologically, as well as the external environment as far as relationships, the literal environment itself, the household that you're in, and really assess all of those particular aspects of the human experience truly as a whole person. And through adapting and buffering each of those environments to be more serving for a higher expression, a, 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 an environment for recovery and repair, that's how you begin to mitigate and offset whatever we, you, you experience that was adverse. And because of how we are just designed through our ability to adapt and overcome, you can heal from those experiences. And we've, I've seen it over and over again in the journeys of right. just wonderful souls who've gone through this horrific experiences. Mm -hmm. And now they're on the other side of it with a whole new narrative of who they are based on that adaptation and that refinement of each of those environments that I mentioned. And I can imagine this can happen at any age, right? I mean, I have many Absolutely. older adult friends who often say, I can't change. I'm going to be stuck this in my way. Ways. <laughs> yeah, it's the rest of my life. Or sometimes there's, I don't want to change, but a lot of times it's, I, I'm too old to change. Well, this is the thing. Um, you can't force ideology upon physiology. And what I mean by that is this. Life by design is about change, is about mm -hmm. becoming, is about seeing, seeking more expression of itself. The moment something stops adapting and changing, what happens to it, Doc? It dies. It starts to die, yeah. Yep. And we see that over and over again within medicine. It's like, mm -hmm. so when you are uh, refusing to adapt to the environment mm -hmm. in which you find yourself, you don't allow yourself to be flexible, be more yeah. fluidic and just flow, and you're rigid in your ways, yeah, those that rigidity starts to set in, <laughs> and yeah. and yeah, and you and you suffer the ill effects of that. And so, the most important thing you can do is to continue to adapt yourself, and grow, and become more. And when I was, mm -hmm. for example, doing my geriatric rotations in medical school, a lot of the elders that we were working with, um, their capacity and their openness of mindset to change behaviors, to change beliefs to change up how they were looking at their lives, moving their bodies, et cetera, were directly influential in their recovery from whatever illness and condition they were dealing with. Mm -hmm. and, if, and the more adaptability they had, the better the outcome for them, the better the yeah. prognosis for them. And so as human beings, yeah, it, it, like I said earlier, you know, uh, the hardest thing for us to do is to think and think critically mm -hmm. about our lives and, and really uh, make the necessary changes due to that critical thinking. But if yeah. you do it, if you have the courage to do it, the results can be amazing. Yeah, and it is scary. And mm -hmm. when you were talking about all those different categories that you can kind of shift, is that part of your Ocon journey? And I'm not yeah, sure if I'm is, saying that correct. Yeah, 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 yeah. Ocon, okay. yeah, Ocon journey, Ocon. yes. That, that is exactly the, okay. the, the, the journey we're on. And, and the premise to that is this, when you come into life, we come into mm -hmm. life whole. Mm -hmm. And as I indicated earlier, you know, we come in, prepare for the environment in which we find. And the beautiful mm -hmm. thing about it, the environment is constantly in flux and shifting. Our environments are always adapting. And, mm -hmm. and in essence, we actually are partly in the creation of the environment in which we're finding ourselves is truly an extension of us. As yeah. for example, your home is an extension of you as my home mm -hmm. is an extension of me right now based on where mm -hmm. I am in my life and based on where you are in your, your life. And so if we have the capacity to begin to shift the environment and it's, it's a synergistic exchange. Mm -hmm. And so I, in essence, can transform myself. And so if I look at the environment of who I am from a, a place of spirit, you know, about my purpose, meaning, the values, and mission 
of me being here on this planet and my connection to something greater than myself. And I become more aware of that and I refine that and I have that level of clarity there. And then that shows up congruently in who I am mentally, emotionally, mm -hmm. and physically. My relationships will reflect that congruency. My work, my contribution in life and finances and the value that I'm bringing to the world will reflect that congruency. And of course, the external environment will reflect that as well. And so that's the capacity that we have as human beings. And so what we do with an Akon journey is take them through that journey of self-examination and self-discovery mm -hmm. and, and becoming that is potentially there for all of us. That's wonderful. What does Akon stand for? Akon is from the Yoruba language and it means okay. one. Okay. Oh, that's wonderful. It also, it also has, uh, based on the accent, it also means mind, heart, and conscience. Oh, appropriate name for the journey that you take people through, right? Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. It's amazing. And you also have a challenge coming up for yes. all of your clients and anyone else who wants to join. Is that, when does that start? And can you it's, talk about it? Absolutely. Yes, definitely. So the challenge is called the don't panic challenge. And it's okay. based on this current environment that we're in over these past 18 months has been extraordinarily unprecedented for us. Mm -hmm. And as human beings, one of the key uh, triggers, if you will, for stress is uncertainty. And there's been a lot of uncertainty as far mm -hmm. as my health and wellness and being exposed to this, you know, this virus, my livelihood, do I still have my job or career? Some people have lost that already. So there's uncertainty mm -hmm. of what's next for them. And all of these things create a lot of stress and anxiety. And so mm -hmm. this challenge is to take you through a five-day challenge of you getting clear on the root of your anxiety and stress so that you can master that. And we take you from there through this process of how your beliefs and expectations tie into this. The rewiring of the brain is what we talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. uh, the restoration of the body and this resilience. And then you in essence reclaiming your life. Cause for a lot of people right now is a lot of people feel like they don't have any control. Yeah. You know, from just the legislation that's going on mm -hmm. at a state level or government level mm -hmm. to just what's happening in your day to day life within your home right now, because everything mm -hmm. that we're experiencing that is so unprecedented for us. So this challenge is a way for you to reclaim you and, and journey back to you. And so uh, we will be doing this on June 7th through the 11th for okay. five days and it's an hour training each day. And we do also have a VIP uh, component where in addition to the training, uh, there's an hour of Q&A and coaching that we'll be providing for those who take up that offer. That offer. Oh, that's great. That's great. And how do people find out more about this? Yeah, absolutely. They can go to my website, uh, mm -hmm. theaconjourney.com. And Akon is spelled O-K-A-N. So it's theaconjourney.com. Okay. Or they can go to... Uh, my Instagram page as well. And that is at the Akon journey. And in either of those places under the bio there, there's a link. And also on the website, there's a link for it. Also. Oh, this is great. And then your other Akon journey program, it's virtual coaching, correctly? One-on-one? -on -one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, it, we, we, we have two offers with that. There's a 12 week and a 12 month program. Okay. And the 12 week program primarily based is we have what we call the seven domains of life mastery. And those seven domains make up who we are as a whole person. So as I was mentioning earlier to you, that who we are of spirit, mind, our emotions, our physical body temple, our relationships, our contribution in the world, as far as what we, how we choose to give our gifts through our career, our financial expression, and then mm -hmm. our environment. And so it's through that Akon journey that we assess all seven areas. And within the 12 week program, we primarily focus on the physical form, the body and okay. the mind, those two domains. Okay. Okay. And the whole purpose of that 12 week is to really help build up the body's resilience because the body, our bodies are truly the limiting factor. <laughs> so without yeah. this, nothing else matters. And True. so for most people who are dealing with stress, burnout, you know, anxiety, or any other imbalance that is now impeding upon their ability to really give their best version of themselves to the world, mm -hmm. we start with that physical form, help restore that. And also the other aspect of us that has a profound impact on how we experience our lives is our mind, our thinking. Okay. So it's through those two, those particular domains that we work with within the 12 week program, whereas a 12 month program, we cover 
all of who you are as a whole person, all seven. That's great. Wonderful. Really appreciate you coming on. Any last minute tip or suggestion or idea you want to share with our audience? Yes. Yeah, so, you know, we, 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 we covered a lot today with mm-hmm. regards to, you know, the impact of stress. I, I just, I would want just the viewers to really understand that you are the source of your healing, that, that, that source of healing is within you. So it, it doesn't matter your story or how you started out or what the, the past has been for you. The key thing is that it is your past. And in this moment, you have the capacity to begin to rewrite that past Mm -hmm. and reframe it. And it does take time. As I indicated earlier, you know, it didn't take us overnight to become who we are. And if we are experiencing a life that is not the most favorable or not the most serving for us, we can begin to take the steps into experiencing a more serving, more fulfilling, more worthy experience of life for ourselves. But it takes you making a healing decision and Mm -hmm. knowing that you're not at fault for anything that you've experienced in your past. However, you are solely responsible for what you do about it right now in your your present moment and your future. Right. Right. It's beautifully said. Really, thank you so much for your time tonight. Thank you. I really appreciate it. And you shared so much valuable information today. It's truly been an honor. Thank you so much for inviting me. (laughs) You're welcome. And thank you all for joining us today. Have a great rest of your weekend. Take care and we'll see you again next weekend. Bye. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.